Good morning, stage three. Well, as you can see, I'm dressed up again for book week. This time I'm a character, again, from Valley of Gold, but a very different character to the Bush Ranger yesterday. As you will have noticed from the pictures you've just scrolled through and a little bit of the information you've gleaned before watching this video, we know that uh, the time of the gold rush, of the time when people actually pulled the gold out of the earth, um, slowed down and ended to a certain extent and people started to enjoy the wealth that the gold brought. And so I'm a character who was one of those lucky ones that actually got to enjoy some of the wealth. Uh, I just wanna flag with you though, that this chapter also raises a part in Australia's history that uh, we are not so proud of. And that is our mistreatment of our First Nations people, our Aboriginal people. There is a character in this chapter, in fact, the chapter is titled Maggie, uh, and Maggie is an Indigenous woman who has faced uh, some mistreatment, and she appears here. And while it is an uncomfortable thing for us to read, because we know that all people uh, should be treated fairly and equally and with dignity, and it's important part of Australia's history, so it's important that we acknowledge it, so that we can make sure that we go forward always treating all people with dignity and respect. Now, as we read this chapter, what we're going to do is we're going to try and pull together all the things that good readers do. We've looked at the idea that before reading, uh, good readers uh, make predictions and they make inferences and they question and they activate their prior knowledge. While they read, they make connections, they visualise, they make inferences, they question and they revise and adjust their predictions. So we're going to try and do a little bit of all of that as we read. I'm not going to stop all the time to do that, but I'm going to try and point out things for you as I read. So I've told you a little bit about the story and the settings that post gold rush time when there was a lot of wealth but also a lot of poverty around. Uh, so I hope you're making some predictions now about what you think might happen in this chapter titled Maggie. Here we go. Every Monday, Mama took Louisa shopping. I'm already making a connection because I often go shopping with my daughters. Uh, so I hope you're making a connection too. They went to the dressmakers, perhaps, for a fitting for a new dress, or to the milliners, somebody who creates hats, or to the haberdashery, it's the fabric shop, for gloves. Shopping meant tea and scones or rock cakes thick with currants, and afterwards, a walk along the main street up to the cordial factory to leave their weekly order. Do you like cordial? Uh, I think my favourite flavour is lime. What's yours? So here we are making connections. To get to the cordial factory, you had to walk past the saddlery and harness makers, the tannery, that was where they made leather, and currery, past Johnston the undertakers, people who dig graves, uh, with the coffin in the window, the dispensary, a bit like a chemist, the butchers with the sheep's head on a plate, mm, the provision store, a bit like the grocery store, with its barrels of butter, giant cheeses and slabs of bacon. It was a good solid town now, a town built by gold, gold from down the valley, gold from the other mining villages around. The gold was deposited in Papa's bank and the bank lent the money to build solid two-storey granite buildings. Here we can make more connections. We know that Orange is a gold mining town. Can you picture, can you visualise some of the two-storey buildings in orange that might have been made with this early gold money? I can. If it wasn't for men like me, Papa once said, this place wouldn't exist. And he'd explained how men like him had turned a wilderness into farms and roads and a shanty town of mud and grog shops into a civilised community with shops and a library and fine buildings. Visualising? The grandest building of all was the courthouse with its tall pillars and marble stairs. Court was in session today, Louisa noticed, peering in over the hatted women and men with neatly oiled hair. For once, the wide doors were open. Someone must have just gone in and forgotten to shut them. 
Louisa, don't stare. Mama's gloved hand pulled Louisa's. I wasn't, began Louisa, staring even harder. She'd never seen inside the courthouse before. She could just hear the magistrate intoning, Drunk and disorderly, I hereby sentence you. So here we're making inferences. Someone's obviously just been charged with drunkenness and disorderly behaviour. Mama pulled her past the door, her silk skirt swishing indignantly. It's not nice to stare. Ladies don't. Someone screamed inside the courthouse. Louisa had never heard a scream like that before. Even the dogs were shocked to silence. The horses stopped in the street. The pigeons scratching in the horse droppings lifted their heads. A woman burst from the courthouse. Her skin was black. Her dress was ragged at the hem. Are we making an inference here? Hopefully you've worked out that this might be the Aboriginal woman, woman I was talking about. Her hair was grey and wild and she was still screaming. Louisa, come away. But Mama, what's happening? The woman ran down the footpath. It was as though she didn't see the woman in their gloves and hats and shawls or the dogs investigating the lampposts. She simply ran and they made way for her, the women staring, small boys laughing as she ran, the dogs barking as they ran alongside. The crowd was spilling down the courthouse stairs, gazing down the street at the running woman. Louisa heard the words, old Maggie. Mama tugged Louisa's hand. You don't want to see things like that. It's not right having a woman like that right here in town. You'd think we were back in the gold rush days. But Mama, what's wrong with her? Why is she screaming? Hush, said Mama. There are some things young ladies don't need to know about. They turned the corner to the cordial factory. The sounds of the main street, the laughter, the whinnying horses, the screams faded. The air here seemed sticky and thick with the smells of simmering cherries and pears and ginger. More inferences to be made? Maybe some questioning going on. I think they're heading to the, well, we know that they're heading to the cordial factory that obviously makes cherry, pear and ginger cordials. But in my mind, I'm also thinking, why did Maggie scream? What's been going on? Why, why such an outburst? She put her sunshade, she put up her sunshade as she came out. Mama was always careful not to let the sun coarsen her skin. A group of girls ran past, barefoot and laughing. School must be out, thought Louisa. She'd have liked to go to school, but Mama wouldn't let her mix with barefoot kids. Mama could teach her all she needed to know with art lessons from Miss Harrington and piano lessons from Mr Fletcher on Saturday afternoons. They turned the corner back into the main street. The crowd had vanished from the courthouse steps, but the screams still echoed up the hill. And my question here is, what is going on? Why, why is Maggie still screaming? Breakfast was at half past eight each morning, early enough to allow Papa to open the bank at 10 o'clock. Late enough to let Mama spend the necessary hour twisting Louisa's hair into ringlets with the hot crimping iron and patting out her own with false chignons and getting Marjorie, the parlour maid, to put the knee in and pull her corset strings to the necessary tightness. So in those days, women wore corsets that were laced up at the back. They'd be pulled super tight to make their waists um, unnaturally thin. Papa was at the big dark breakfast table when Louisa and Mama came in, his plate of porridge in front of him. Good morning, morning Papa, Louisa dutifully kissed his cheek. He smelt of hair oil and bay rum and his wool suit smelt of sweat. Good morning, my dear, Papa put the newspaper down on the polished table. Did you sleep well? Quite well, thank you, Papa. Louisa sat down in front of her bowl of porridge then reached for the silver jug and began to pour cream carefully around the edges. Papa frowned. My dear, ring for Marjorie, will you? This toast's like leather. Mama leant over and pulled the long bell pull. No one answered. So in my mind, I can visualise this because I've seen examples of it in old homes and I'll stop and explain. Uh, in the very fancy mansions of this time, there would be a cable that came down from the ceiling 
Um, and when you pulled on it, it would ring a bell in the servants' quarters so that they knew you needed something and they'd come running. Mama sighed. <sighs> Gossiping with the milk boy, probably. Louisa, would you go and ask for fresh toast, please? Yes, Mama. Louisa put her napkin back on the table and walked down the hallway to the kitchen. She pushed open the door. Marjorie and Cook were at the back door and there was the milk boy, just as Mama had expected, their billy of fresh milk in his hand. Dead as a doornail, he was saying. Just lying there, she was. She ran all the way from town, screaming and screaming, then just dropped dead, right there, looking out on the valley. Well... At least she saw it again before she died, said Cook comfortably. Please, said Louisa. Mama said, could we have fresh toast? The milk boy started and touched his cap to her. Uh, certainly, Miss Louisa, said Cook. Will that be all? Yes, thank you, said Louisa. She paused. That person you were talking about, was that the old black woman from the courthouse? Old Maggie, said the milk boy. He was about her age. He had bare feet and his cap was stained and greasy. She was a right one, they say. Escaped being rounded up with the other blacks somehow. Lived all her life down in the valley. Used to make a devil of a fuss when she'd got some rum in her. The Valley Ladies Guild, they told the police, would get rid of her. I saw her, said Louisa softly. I heard her screaming. The boy met her eyes. Broke her heart, I reckon. That magistrate saying that they'd lock her up and then send her to the camp down the coast? A broken heart, thought Louisa. That's what that scream sounded like. The sound of a heart breaking. Imagine loving a place so much it broke your heart to leave it. For a moment, her life felt empty. Time you were off, said Cook said firmly to the milk boy. She took the billy of milk and shut the door and turned to Louisa. I'll bring the toast in a minute. Thank you, said Louisa. She pushed through the swinging door out into the dark wooden hallway, which smelt of floor polish and potpourri and Mama's gardenia scent. The carpet was soft under her boots. The starched ruffles rustled on her dress. But she could still hear the screams. And that's the end of that chapter. But I'm going to read another short chapter to you because it explains a little bit more about what was going on at that time in the valley. When white settlers first came to the valley, the valley's Aboriginal people were generally taller, stronger, faster and more muscular than the new settlers. In those days, the valley was an almost paradise where you could make little effort to live well. Although there were none of the massacres or poisoning of Aborigines here that happened in other areas, Yep, that's really awful. Within a few decades, most of the Aboriginal people had died of measles or flu or smallpox or tuberculosis, all terrible illnesses, or of starvation as their land was taken for mining or farming. Many were killed or forced down the coast in battle to battles with, sorry, many were killed or forced down to the coast in battles with Aboriginal men from much further away, who had also had their land taken from them, and some were sent to the camps at the coast by local magistrates. By 1890, the few remaining Aboriginal people worked either as servants or farmhands, usually just for food and clothing, so no actual wages. Their employers didn't give them wages that the white workers received, in case they put it to, quote, improper use. In other words, they weren't allowed to decide how to spend their own money. Their Aboriginal names had been changed to insulting nicknames. Kararalt became Frying Pan Jack, Winbirba became Dirty Dick, Nolawara, Stupid Tommy, Bonging Hall, Billy the Bull, and Curran Young was Cranky. Those who didn't choose to spend their lives as unpaid servants to white masters hunted where they could, begged for food or alcohol, or sold the only thing the new settlers would pay for. The valley was very different from the quiet world of water lily feasts and wild ducks they'd known, and now it would change again. Now the dredges had come to the valley, great wood-powered machines that sifted the sand and mud and gravel faster than human hands could manage, and ate up all the trees that could be hauled for them. 
The hills were bare except for stumps and grass and brown smudges as the land washed away without the trees to hold the topsoil in place. The air smelt of smoke and the cold smell of crushed rock from the few remaining mines. Most mines now filled with water before the miners reached gold-bearing rock. And the lagoons where the dredges dug stank of stagnant water and sewerage. The only tall trees now clung among the cliffs and up in the gorge country where it was too steep to fell them and roll them down to the flat land and the waiting dredges. In 1914, war came to the world outside the valley. Many of the valley's young men volunteered to fight for the English motherland, few of them had ever seen, and that would do little, if anything, for them in return. Churches, schools and newspapers thundered about the brutishness and fruit frightfulness of the German Huns. The enemy in every war is always seen as brutish and frightful. Women made jam and Anzac biscuits to raise money for the soldiers and knitted socks and scarves and balaclavas to send to them in battle. Most of the young men who sailed away to war never returned. Those who did come back rarely, sorry, those who did come back rarely spoke of the horror they had seen in the trenches. Many of the valley's mines closed down during the war and there were no longer enough men to work them. Only one dredge worked full time as wages were higher now that labour was scarce and the cost of firewood to run the dredges was higher too. But 100 men were still employed in dredging, even during 1919 when more people died worldwide from flu than in the war. But by the end of the war to end all wars, at the beginning of every war people think that the fighting will solve all the problems instead of creating new ones, most of the valley's gold had already been mined and by 1920, even the power of the dredges could no longer find much gold. So tomorrow we'll continue reading. And as you can see, we're watching time pass in the valley. So in essence, we've moved past the, the original gold mining days, but there's still lots for us to learn about how that gold mining and the history of our world changed one place, this valley of gold.